Hello everyone, this is Paleoner here with a somewhat unexpected addition to my scientific analysis series. Today is a bit of a detour from the main series to make some corrections and additions to my previous videos. Don't worry, Deep Sea Killers will be coming out very soon, but I wanted to fix some of the mistakes I made in my previous videos first. Although I do a tremendous amount of research when making my videos, I have definitely made some mistakes. Leaving out important information and even just straight up saying things that aren't true. So, I'm going to do the right thing and own up to those mistakes by correcting them and making sure that none of my viewers have been misinformed. This probably won't be as long as a proper analysis, but don't quote me on that. We'll be starting off this video with my very first analysis, Cannibal Dinosaur. If you remember, this is where I covered quite a lot about Majungasaurus and how much the real animal differs from how Jurassic Fight Club portrays it, from its proportions to the name to even its eating habits. In fact, I said so much about Majungasaurus that my Cannibal Dinosaur analysis pretty much doubles as a Majungasaurus creature profile. However, I did miss some things. While abelosaurids couldn't use their heads as battering rams, some scientists have theorized that male abelosaurids could have done brief shoving matches when competing for territory or mates. So they probably could use their heads when fighting, but not in the way it is shown in Jurassic Fight Club. Another thing I missed is how the show attempts to explain the Jungasaurus's rather unorthodox appearance. In the show, they claim that since Madagascar was an island, the Majungasaurus had problems with inbreeding, and thus Majungasaurus evolved its short and robust head. This is complete bullshit, as the head shape of Majungasaurus is common throughout Abelosaurids, most of which didn't even live on islands. And most importantly, it shows that the people working on this series don't really know how inbreeding works. Inbreeding, or breeding within a family, doesn't immediately create ugly monstrosities of nature. Rather, it simply increases the chance that a repressed gene within the family is expressed in the offspring. This can often include severe genetic disorders, but it typically only weakens the immune system of the offspring. Also, Madagascar may be an island, but it was incredibly large, even during the Cretaceous, at an area of over 200,000 square miles, meaning there was plenty of room for a population of large theropods to survive without inbreeding. Besides, many millions of species of animals live on islands today, and as far as I can tell, they are no more likely to inbreed than animals on the mainland. Finally, Something I kind of addressed, but didn't really, is that theropods probably didn't use their tails as weapons. Since they were very muscular and stiff, theropods really couldn't move their tails all that much, and as such, trying to hit something with it would be very awkward. Instead, theropods likely use their tails more as a counterbalance, to store fat within their bodies and to help power the muscles in their legs and allow them to run at faster speeds than other animals their size. That's it for things I missed, but before I move on to T-Rex Hunter, I did make two minor mistakes involving some of the pictures used in the video, which may misinform some people. First, we have the segment where I brought up that Majungasaurus likely had osteoderms based on the discovery of skin impressions of its close relative Carnotaurus, which, also, which showed signs of osteoderms. That still holds, but the problem is I used the wrong picture. Rather than a Carnotaurus skin impression, I accidentally used a picture of preserved Triceratops skin. Luckily, I have found a better picture that actually illustrates what I was talking about. Finally, near the end of the video, one of the pictures I used depicted a feathered Majungasaurus, which is very unlikely. While we have no skin impressions of Majungasaurus, 
It is likely that it had mostly completely scaly skin with osteoderms like Carnotaurus and probably lacked filaments of any kind. It's just a minor thing and I doubt anyone was seriously misinformed by it, but it does somewhat contradict what I said in the episode in the video. Anyway, now we're on to T-Rex Hunter. So my T-Rex Hunter analysis turned out really well overall, and I think it's one of my best videos. But there are some things I want to add that I forgot to mention, as, and I also made some mistakes that I would like to correct. First, the show makes the same misconception about T-Rex's environment as every other dinosaur documentary in the 2000s, stating it was a volcanic and ash-filled wasteland. However, this couldn't be farther from the truth, as there is no real evidence of volcanic activity in North America during the late Cretaceous period. In fact, Hell Creek is believed to have been very wet and swamp-like during the late Cretaceous, more like the Florida Everglades in a volcanic ash field. Also, T-Rex's bite force is stated to be 3,000 pounds per, per square inch, which is very weak for tyrannosaurs and is more along the line of a saltwater crocodile. T-Rex's bite was likely much stronger, being estimated to reach a force of 8,000 pounds per square inch, and maybe even more than that. Finally, a few other minor inaccuracies I missed. The show occasionally misspells Nanotyrannus as Nanotyrannosaurus, which is completely invalid and doesn't refer to any actual organism. The show claims that oxygen levels were higher during the Mesozoic era than they are today, when during the Triassic and early Jurassic, oxygen levels were actually lower than today, although they were slightly higher during the Cretaceous. T-Rex is said to be the ultimate predator when many predators likely surpassed it. They say it fears nothing but somehow forget Triceratops and an adult Admonosaurus. And finally, the show proposes that juveniles could have been feathered but don't actually show the juveniles with any film and coverings whatsoever. Although the last one is likely budget related. Now come the things I did wrong when analyzing this episode. First, I accidentally said the fight was set in Montana when it actually takes place in South Dakota. Probably the biggest error, however, was when I incorrectly stated that it is, it is impossible to determine a dinosaur's gender. However, I had completely forgotten about B. rex, a rather unique T. rex specimen which possessed a medullary bone, which only appears in female egg-laying creatures like birds during or just before egg-laying. As such, paleontologists were able to conclusively identify the T-Rex as a female and a pregnant one at that. So there is a way to see if a dinosaur is male or female. You just have to find a dinosaur that happened to die while pregnant and look for a medullary bone. Not easy, but doable. Next, I stated that predators killing off competition and then not eating them isn't something that happens in nature when lions in the African savanna do just that with other predators. Finally, this was technically in my gang killers video, but it concerns T-Rex Hunter. In that video, I claimed that Jurassic Fight Club probably made up the fossil discovery the fight was based on. However, it turns out I was completely wrong. I just didn't do enough research. While Jurassic Fight Club has made several inaccuracies that other documentaries wouldn't dare make, it wouldn't stoop so low as to completely make up a fossil discovery in order to justify an episode on T-Rex. The fight in the episode is in fact based on an actual discovery in Bell Forge, South Dakota, which featured a juvenile Tyrannosaurus with teeth surrounding it which resembled that of the animal formerly known as Nanotyrannus. So, George and the producers of the show logically concluded that Nanotyrannus was the Jason Voorhees of dinosaurs and relentlessly stalked and killed baby T-Rexes. However, what likely really happened still stands, as the juvenile was probably just killed by an older T-Rex, likely one similar to Jane based on the teeth. 
Although another possibility is that the teeth have nothing to do with the baby's killer and were just shed by another T-Rex or the baby itself. There's also the fact that many of the other paleontologists in the show expressed their doubts about the existence of Nanotyrannus, but the show just completely ignores them because it wouldn't make a cool premise. Thankfully, I didn't miss much in my gang killers analysis, although there are a few minor inaccuracies I missed. First, the show suggests that the Western Interior Seaway and Inland Sea would split North America into two subcontinents that lasted from the mid-Cretaceous period to the early Paleogene had already been formed by the time the episode is set, around 115 million years ago. However, while the WIS was forming during this time, it did not fully appear until around 90 to 85 million years ago. Also, George makes a really big deal out of Deinonychus having backward pointing teeth. They've got razor sharp teeth, and these teeth curve backwards. When you are bitten by an animal with teeth that point backwards, it's going to rip a chunk of flesh out of you. When pretty much every predator, with some exceptions, have backward pointing teeth. Pretty much the only theropods that didn't have teeth that curved curved backward were fish eaters like spinosaurs and unanlogenes. Next, the show tries and fails to explain the respiratory system of theropods, pointing out that Deinonychus likely had a system of ear sacs similar to birds. This is accurate for the mo most part, as pretty much all theropods and sauropods possessed these ear sacs, but the way they describe them insinuates that theropods didn't exhale, which is just not the case. All air-breathing vertebrates exhale, air sacs or not. Finally, the Deinonychus are shown to be smart enough to use lightning to hide their footsteps, something way out of the question for a non-avian theropod. As for mistakes, there is only one minor thing. I used crocodiles and the hawks as a comparison for Deinonychus being a solitary animal when both crocodiles and hawks are known to hunt cooperatively at times. This ironically still fits the comparison I was trying to make, as Deinonychus may have hunted cooperatively at times, but not for very long. That's really it, now to wrap things up with Bloodiest Battle. I know, I know. My Bloodiest Battle video just came out, and thankfully, my Bloodiest Battle video doesn't seem to have too many errors, but there are a few things I missed in my analysis that I wasn't able to fix in time. First is that the show tries to explain that sauropods could grow so big because the oxygen levels in the air were higher during the Jurassic than they are today. However, as I said earlier, up until the mid-Jurassic, oxygen levels were actually lower than they are today, and during the late Jurassic, they were about the same as today. Also, giant sauropodomorphs have existed since the late Jurassic, which had less oxygen than today, so more oxygen was probably not the cause of the sauropod's large size. The real reason that sauropods could grow so large is more likely because they were surprisingly rather lightweight for their size. Although sauropods were the largest terrestrial animals to ever exist, they would actually be a lot heavier if it weren't for the combined force of a system of air sacs accompanying the lungs that helped to extract more oxygen in the air and relatively hollow bones. These helped the sauropods grow to massive sizes that were out of, rain, out of the range for mammals, which lacked both air sacs and hollow bones. The odd thing is that the only sauropod in the entire series is Camarasaurus, which isn't very big for a sauropod, so they really didn't need to justify the large size of sauropods anyway. Another thing that this show somehow got wrong is that they show and describe sauropods chewing their food. Morris also owed its success to a set of five inch long spoon shaped teeth that paleontologists realized could defoliate entire trees at will. The teeth of Camarasaurus actually interlock. They have kind of tongue and 
groove almost one into each other. They would almost function like a, a serrated beak or a single large cutting surface. So they're probably stripping vegetation quite effectively. Zorobods had small peg-like teeth, which could really only be used for stripping off leaves and other softer plants. And they couldn't chew like hadrosaurs and ceratopsians could. Instead, sauropods used gastroliths, stones that they would swallow to mush up their food within their stomachs. Another small detail is that the show states that the Allosaurus was the first giant theropod to roam North America. This is somewhat debatable, it just depends on how big you consider it to be giant. The first considerably large theropod known from North America would probably be Dilophosaurus, which weighed almost half a ton and lived about 40 million years before Allosaurus. That does it for today. I do believe I just about covered everything I missed now, although you probably shouldn't quote me on that either. I plan to go much more in depth with my research in future videos to avoid having to do more videos like this. Be on the lookout for my deep sea killers analysis as that also should be coming out very soon. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned some new things. Be sure to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time, probably later this week.